Alright, All right, I want you guys to be thinking about this. This is sort of a sort of a special topic slash engines to tear up. We got a 93 Jeep Grand Cherokee, four liter, 220,000 miles, be cranked, it won't start. Alright. So uh, crank positions. This is what the guy told me. He actually sent me this through my website. You know, I used to take a lot of emails through my website for people needing help. And these are some of the stories that we had. Uh, the cam sensor check good, 8 volt, 10, flux, so 0 to 5 when trying to crank those. See, the, the sensors, the camera, the crank sensors, and the vehicle speed sensors, all these would have a, it actually had 9 volts going through there on an orange wire. That's the reference voltage the three wire hall effects. Fuel pressure was 30 psi in the rail. Coil, 8 months old, he thought the spark was weak. He said it sparked to the engine head or bracket bolt, will not spark to the plug or distributor cap tower. Now that's peculiar, isn't it? All right, so he, he disconnected the negative battery cable. He owned, checked the coil, whatever. He owned, checked it good at AutoZone, shotgun, replaced the cap motor, plug wire, et cetera, folks. All that. The new coil wire, no start, no spark. Is it possible for the coil to ohm out good and still be bad? All right, so what are you telling me? No. Sounds like he's, he sounds like he's moving in the direction of a weak spark, isn't it? You got that? He didn't see the screen. It said cell phone. I don't think he got hold of you. All right. What is that? What I said. Here's the tip. If it's got a weak spark and good voltage going into the coil, replace the coil. Home check it. Doesn't prove the secondary side of the coil is working right. We've done well with diagnostics. But what you do, and you basically, you take a screwdriver or whatever, and you hold it by that coil down there, and you start that thing popping, and it ought to stretch, and it ought to get an inch long and just scare the daylights out of you and be like lightning. And if you stretch it and it gets about three-eighths of an inch long and it quits popping, you're not going to have, a, you're not going to work. You ain't going to start a truck usually. Especially when the end is cold. So, anyway. You put a new coil on it. Problem fixed, new coil, so much better. Uh, experience rounds out the book info, see. Uh, but I'll tell you what the book info says. A book info that I've seen, and I don't know what the newest books say, but the book info says a quarter of an inch is all you're supposed to admit it, Joe. That was okay when you were using points in a condenser. But with this electronic ignition, it'll talk a lot harder than that. All right, 1990 GMC pickup, 578, 230,000 miles, runs hot. All right, his engine's been well maintained, burns a little oil, always starts. Third set replaced two months ago, vehicle still running at high temp range, runs around 210 when 75 or less, around 220 when 80 degrees outside or higher. So the ambient temperature is going to have an obvious uh, effect on when driven 70 to 80 miles an hour, the temp is going above 235, and I turn off the AC and it goes down a little bit. So he was going up, it was going over 235 when driving slower idling, AC over 220 when driving 55 in Florida, and you have 95, blah, 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 blah. What do you think's going on with him? <coughs> what do you say? You get a bad thermostat? Well, the thermostats I've seen would be bad at opening too soon, but, you know, that's not a terrible place to go, but. I was just sort of sorting this kind of stuff out. Whenever they give you enough information, you can do it. Like, <laughs> one time I got an email, and I actually posted that funny little post on Facebook, and it says, when I fire my can, it make a whoom noise. What caused it? What? I ain't kidding you. That's exactly what they really, when I fire my can, it make a whoom noise. What caused it? What can cause it? And my answer was, I have no idea what you just said. <laughs> fire my can, it make a whoom noise, really? All right. I said, start by having a radiator removed and clean on an old one like that if it's brass, you know. <clears throat> so, have a block flush, be my first two ideas, any block flush. So, I, I said, just flush out the cooling system really good. Probably a stack up of several factors, because a lot of times, if the water pump's a little bit wore out and the radiator's a little bit clogged, the radiator can be clogged externally and cause it. Remember, I told you guys, whenever you're pulling the, whenever you, between the condenser, it really amazes me how. Uh, dog fennels and grass and stuff can go right through the condenser and stop right there at the radiator. And you can't look at the front of it until there's nothing there, but when you pull that thing back, you've got all kinds of crud in there. And I've seen that kind of stuff. And I've actually took radiators off before when I knew there was nothing particularly bad wrong on the inside of it or just to try it out and wash it out with a pressure washer. Just on the inside, get all the dirt and crud out of it. Take care of that. <clears throat> anyway, so. He said, due to the age of his truck, he's going to pop, pop a radiator in. That took care of his whole problem. The guy that lives across the road from me over, his daughter drives a PT Cruiser. It is a, uh, I don't know what year model it is, it's probably early 2000s, something like that. And uh, I told him uh, when he got his daughter that thing, I says, one day, 
this thing's going to start overheating because that's what PT cruisers do. You got it? And that's his. And so when it starts overheating, and I see the hood up on it over there, I'll know that y'all started having an overheating problem. Well, it was about two years, but uh, I stuck my head out the window when I was driving out, and I said, what's going on with the PT Cruiser? He goes, it's overheating. And I said, he said, I said, you know what I would do? He said, what? I said, I'd put a radiator, a cooling fan, and a thermostat in it. See what that does. And so later on, I saw him, and he goes, that took care of the whole problem. It ain't overheating anymore. <laughs> cooling fan is like the die on those. You know, I lose commentators and all that stuff. Anyway, but you see the clogged radiator pin, I mean, you know, let's say you take them apart, you take a radiator apart, I'll take the cap and look up the end of them and all that. All right, so 05 Dodge Neon so SXT 2 liter speed sensor and interplacing. Can I do it? So my input output speed sensor is bad. I've been having issues with my car. This would be a driveline thing, right? Having issues with the car's speed for a while, so I've got a diagnostic test at Amco. I give them a printout. They wanted $300 to replace the sensors. How do we go about doing this? This is Megan, you know, or her fiance or want to see about doing this job right here. And so, okay, this is the 2005 Dodge Neon SXT 2 liter. There's a sensor, there's a sensor. Those two sensors are plastic. Now you gotta take some of some stuff out of the way to get to it, but there they are. You can do it flat foot, just standing on the ground. You don't have to jack the car up. All right, so I sent her this picture. I said, there you go. And so pretty easy to do stuff. So they spent $30 and they popped a couple of sensors in it and all that, you know. Of course, the thing about it is Amco's got overhead. You know, they actually have to pay their mechanics. They've got to pay the shop and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but I'm a great believer, just like just probably everybody in here, if you can do it yourself, you know, why not do it yourself? You have any trouble on that. Now, here's the Jeep Grand Cherokee. This is an easy one. You'll be able to figure this one out real quick. Front passenger side studs for the lugs keep breaking. I replaced the rim studs, lugs, and rotor. It broke again. What could be causing that? Always the same wheel. All right. I said, they ought to be torqued to about 100 foot pounds, no more. How many times has this happened and how long is it between incidents? He says, I got the Jeep a month ago. About a week after I got it was the first time they broke it. Out and had it fixed. Two weeks after that, I checked and they were loose. Every one of them. So I took a four way and tied them down again. Drove 30 miles, checked them every now and then. Last night when I got ready to head home, I had two lugs and two studs left. He says, it's opening or oval shaping the holes on the wood. Could it be something bent on the hub or the holes for the studs sit in the back of the hub strip? What's up with that? Okay. Torque. What do you say? Anybody got any ideas? I bet Walt Rayons have never broken the studs. Are these factory wheels or chrome aftermarket with the wrong lug nuts, different degree on the bevel, will cause them to repeatedly come loose like that. Make sure the lug nuts are the right bevel for those wheels. They're factory wheels off another Jeep and they're new lug nuts. How would I get the right one? I said, take one of the nine problem lug nuts to the dealer and get five just like it. He said, hey, the bevel was wrong. The place that fixed it the first time used the cheap lugs instead of getting the right one, so I did all the work myself. Spent a little more to get the right one. Thank you, Steve. That's what I was talking about the other day on the doggone uh, charger. Put the doggone lug nuts that are supposed to go on there. Don't you see a lug nuts and lug nut be yeah, hate. That don't work. Because a lot of the times you may get away with it for a while. But I knew this guy that had a 72 Chevelle and he had put some uh, chrome wheels on that thing. Right? I got a brand new, he bought a brand new a royal blue with a racing strap. Do I need to write you down for a cell phone violation? What's up with that? All right, so anyway, so he's driving down the road and his wheels keep coming off. I don't know how many times his wheels run off that burn thing up and down the road. And it, all, and it turned out at the end of the day, and this was back in 1973 or 4, he wound up having the wrong lug nut. It was his whole problem on that doggone thing. Somebody had put the chrome wheels on it, they just put the factory lug nuts on it. They didn't put the lug nuts that you're supposed to put on with those chrome wheels. Anyway, uh, 94 Camaro wiper problem. You ever seen a wiper? Quit working on one? Please. I think it would be good. The wiper plates would shut off with stop in the upright position. So I tried fiddling with a wiper motor, and when wiping, they'll pause in the upright position. They should be pausing in the down position. But when it shut off, it'll stop three quarters of the way down to the windshield and not all the way down like they're supposed to. On the Toyota, one time that I worked on, it was because the arm on the motor was hanging up. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, sometimes the, the trend, they call it the wiper transmission, all that junk in here. Sometimes you'll have trouble with that. This is what I told you. This wiper motor problem. Try the board first. When I have a bad motor. That board in there, you can buy that usually at the parts store for 40, 50 bucks. And it's not that hard to change. And it's got the part points in it and all that kind of stuff. And those electronics kind of crap out. Said, what do you mean by trying the board first and how would you check it? That was an answer. And I said, the board's not something you can check, but it's something you can buy. And the part number is 8, 11, 10, 12 BP, costs about $45. And I put the part contacts in circuit. He's got all that stuff in there. And they fail all the time on GM vehicles. I don't know how many times. The wipers either do crazy stuff like that or it won't work or that kind of thing. And so if the brushes are damaged, you need a whole motor. So he never got back with me, but I'm assuming. Now, this one here is pretty cool. A 98 Honda ported six cylinder has intermittent starting problems. The engine cranks but does not start. This happens with no warning. Sometimes weeks elapse between failures, but every time after calling AAA and getting the car towed to the mechanic, the car starts immediately. Therefore, my mechanic cannot diagnose the problem. Well, put yourself in the mechanic's position. The car comes off, and I've had this. The car comes off the hook. Hmm. Start it 50 or 60 times, drive it around, start it some more, drive it around, start it some more. Can you get it to do it before they get down to their favorite stop sign? They switch it off at this convenience store, you know, and it comes back up here. What are you going to do about that? So was it getting hot when it won't start back up? No, it wasn't getting hot. It just would fail to start. Now, Stacy, actually, I caught one of these in the act of doing this one time that we had in the service bay out here. And I would. Johnny on the spot, and I found the problem, and I says, well, I'm going to remember that. And so Stacy had a vehicle that belonged to her or somebody that was doing that just here periodically, and I said, I'm going to do this and just see what happens. And so I did this, and it had no more trouble. And so I've seen this several times since then, and so what I did was, I said, that PDF, PGM F5 main relay, that thing there, under the dash, and it's got the fuel pump relay in it and something like the eight power relay all built in. It's a relay with it's all internal, seven terminals. In and so I says, uh, every time I've ever seen one of these doing this, that, that relay fixed it. And that's the kind of wiring schematic. That's what it looked like. It's under the dash up here. Said, that's a silver bullet. He says, it worked just like you said. Never had any more trouble with it. That was a silver bullet. Silver bullets are few and far between. You don't usually have a silver bullet for anybody. One time this lady called me about a Ford Explorer, and she said, sometimes when I go to start this thing, it's really, really hard to start, and it acts up, and sometimes it won't idle and all that, and so we don't know what to do. And uh, I wasn't working at the dealership at the time. And I says, uh, I walked out there, and I said, you see that idle air control right there? He said, yeah. I said, can, your, can your, uh, your son, he was like your age, I said, can he use a wrench? She goes, yeah. Them two bolts right there, hold that. Go buy one of those, put it in there, and you'll be in a fat city. But then things like to stick. So she put one on there, and she was like, yay! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I didn't have time to fool with all that. I had too many cars to fix. There was a time when I was over there and I was doing all the drivability work at that dealership where we run 100 cars a day through the shop. I was doing 12, 15 cars a day. I didn't even have time to sell a tune-up then. All right, so when I approach a red light, it's been on this Toyota Camry four-cylinder, and I apply pressure on the brake to stop the car, but lately it's doing this. It hits the brake, continues to apply pressure on it to keep the car from moving, but once the car stops, I can feel and see my foot moving deeper. And the car starts to move, and then it stops immediately within a second race. What's wrong with it? Air in the line? Hmm? Air in the brake line? Or the the he hadn't ever done anything to it. He's all of a sudden started doing this, huh? Vacuum machine. You ever seen that here? Huh? Master cylinder? Listen to him. Listen to him. Now, what did you put a master cylinder on for this? You changed one, remember? Did you change the one on the on the uh, Sonata for that same problem? I think so. Well, where did you come up with master cylinder, Mr. I know it all? <laughs> I'm impressed that you knew that because that's the right answer, huh? When you press the brake and push the brake. When you press the brake, it initially feels good. Yeah, and then it starts to fall from under your foot, and then the car starts to move, and you can get another bite, and it'll do it again. That's a master cylinder. What do you say? He says, got a bad master cylinder. He says, Finally got time to fix it. He, this guy right here was a real uh, gearhead. He pulls the master cylinder off, takes it apart. And he found a little chipped, you know, cup in there. He wanted to rebuild it. Now, you can't get no parts. You know, used to, back in the day, we used to rebuild every wheel cylinder we did on uh, drum brakes 
and we used to rebuild all the master cylinders and all this kind of stuff. We'd get parts for them. Those were the 70s. We're not there anymore. I tried to find the seals only, but they don't sell them that way. I probably cost them a dollar to replace the seals and turn around so he was laying, you know. But they do more than just replace the seals in there. All right, 99 Dodge Ram 5.2. This is fun. This one's fun. Truck had been sitting for over a year. Started right up, ran fine, drove for about two miles, the engine started to lose power, and it quit. You thinking? You guys are thinking, Captain? Put in some fresh gas. It started, but was running poorly, then quit. Checked for spark, found none, had the unit towed home, added more fuel, charged the battery, it would crank over, but no spark. Scanned it, found a fault code for the crank sensor. Sounds good, right? Replaced it. Still wouldn't start. Checked it a day later. Started, but ran very rough. Warmed up, ran okay. Next day, same problem, no start. Out of the place. Call, out of air control, distributor sensor, crank sensor, cap, rotor, wires, and plug. Check connected to the PCM fuse box connectors. I'm a total loss. It'll start one day and run fine. The next day, nothing. Note the days that it will not start. I get on, get one plug to fire, and the other seven are dead. What can it be? You have to store this in your pumpkin now. What? You're making up as he goes again. What is that? Typically, the camera sensor alignment has to be set, but that won't explain why it doesn't run well cold. Do you have data stream data? Oh, yeah, I've got a snap on scanner. Thanks for applying. I've used the snap on scanner. When it wouldn't start, I get a no crankshaft position, but I have had the truck start for days after I gave back the scanner. It would run smooth or start off ratty and then smooth out. This one's got me stumped and my ego's on the line with my youngest son who thinks I can fix anything. This guy's a, he's a real trooper, man. He's going after it. I said, that's crank sensor related. When you replace the crank sensor, it should have a cardboard spacer on the end of it. You're supposed to shove the crank sensor with that spacer into contact with the flywheel pulse ring, slot it here on the crank sensor, torque the sensor. The first time you spin it over, the spacer skins off of there, and that sets the gap. If the crank sensor is too close to the ring, it won't run right. If it's too far, it won't run right. It's peculiar. BWD cell hole spacer, part number CS919. Sensor spacing is, I imagine, your problem. That's what it looks like. That's a sensor, that's a paper spacer. He said, I bought an aftermarket sensor and it didn't have a spacer, so I just put it in. My thought was the sensor mounted on the block so the clearance would be slipped. I'll get one from Dodge and try it. All right, so my electric fan is standing on all the time. And I'll tell you how I found out about that sensor. I was putting one back together one time when I was over at the Jeep dealer, and I was putting one back together. And back in the day, the old uh, 87 to 90 model Jeeps that had that Bendix fuel injection system had to have uh, the, the uh, crank sensor was not really adjustable, but if it was because the product, you know, got variability in the field, if that sensor was a little too far from that pulse ring, it wouldn't put out enough voltage for that crank and for that thing to pick it up. And so what I would do is I had a little notch cut in a lot of kind of a long pry bar screwdriver thing I had, and I, you know, I would measure the voltage coming out of that thing. It needed to be 480 millivolts. And if it was like 200 millivolts, I would have somebody spin it over while I bumped it and get a little closer. And it would have, when I got it up to 480, all those problems would go away. Just putting a new sensor on it, we wouldn't usually fix it, but you know, that would. So anyway, I felt like on one, we put one of these back in. I didn't know nothing about a paper spacer at the time. I just got it as close as I could, and it was terrible. And then I got it a little too far away. It was terrible. I noticed it was adjustable, and that's when I found out about the stupid paper spacer. I got a box of them paper spacers in my office. <laughs> and I, guess, you know, I was doing the Charles Hudson thing. We would just try it at PA. You know? All right, the electric fan was staying on all the time. You hear that? Did you get that? Sorry about that. Electric fan staying on all the time. My father's a retired mechanic hooked the switch for the manual turn the fan on. That's the Charles way, isn't it? Hook up switch. Turn it on. All right, so we think it's an electrical problem before I hand it over to the electrical deck. What ask me what it might be. And I said, you say cooling the cooling fan relay is a solid state relay and it's kind of hidden, it looks like that. It's way back in there. See the, the right front tire? It's back in there under the back behind the headlight. It's on that and it's aggravating to get to it. But anyway, you can't really see it. Anyway, all fixed. I'd seen that before. It was a, I got kind of smacked around by one of them before and I did a wiring schematic trace. I said, well, let's unplug this. Hmm, unplug it, went away. That thing was shorted internally. All right, so got a 95 cheaper at 4.6. Started sputtering, lost power, died. The fuel pump wasn't putting out enough pressure, so I replaced it. Still won't work. 
checked the spark. It was sparking, but I checked the coils was not reading anything. Uh, one was not reading the other. Another reads 12.2 ohm resistance. So I went to the junkyard and got another one that reads 12.2, and then they're supposed to be between you know, 13, 14 ohms. Blah blah blah. They're sparking through. All right. So now he orders the cam sensor, put that in because the code popped up for it once before all this. Now my car still won't start. The plugs are wet. Smells like gas. Really strong. while I crank it? Put the new plugs and wires in and replace the crank sensor. Have you ever seen people doing this? That's just throw stuff at it. <laughs> well, he was paying the bill, but you know, a lot of the times people will do that and they run slam out of money and then they want you to come and work a miracle. You know, <laughs> I mean, that's just the way that worked, you know. All right, so I think it's a spark problem because I tried to start through it and it didn't change anything. So, okay, we know a couple of things already. First, we know you're getting fuel. I assume you check the pressure with the gauge. We know you have fuel injection, the injectors are clicking. Both these first two pieces of data because your spark plugs are wet. If you don't want to put any fuel in there, you don't want spark plugs. We know you got spark, should be good and strong, able to jump about an inch, and we know you got good spark plug because you replaced them, unless the new spark plugs are bad, which almost never happens, although I have seen that with a set of champion spark plugs. So don't, don't quote me on that. The fact is, it has all of these elements and it won't fire, it leads us to go deeper and look other places besides spark fuel and electronics. Where are we going to look? That's there, close bottom position. Yeah. Now my next question is, did it start skipping and quit all on the same day? Or did you notice the loss of power for a while, a few days or weeks before it finally died? If the exhaust is totally clogged, it can keep it from starting. That's the question about how long you have been experiencing symptoms. I'd be checking the compression to see if there was some kind of timing chain issue, low compression on one or more cylinders. How does it sound when you spin it? Would it point in this direction? You've eliminated a lot of stuff. All right. So he said he actually did the compression test, and he wound up with low compression on number six, but that shouldn't keep it from starting. Okay. All right. Regretfully, the engine has failed the test. You know, he said somebody rebuilt it for him a while back. The compression is all over the place, but that wasn't the cause of the no start. He unbolted the exhaust pipes, and it fired right up. <laughs> so he has, he's also stopped there. If the exhaust is completely clogged, you can take half the spark plugs out and it will fire up. Kind of like a machine gun. You know, but <clears throat> anyway, we're going to do that before too. That's the end of the slideshow. So did y'all have a good time? Yes. Okay, now I've got two more slideshows just like this and we'll be ready to go to lunch. <laughs> oh, I'm kidding. Y'all know I'm kidding, right? Uh -huh. <clears throat> you know, these slideshows really wear me out. That, that burger feels real good. That's a good eating when I get up there, docks after that. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> now you've seen that, right? Yeah. You know how that happened? Rubbing against each other. Rubbing against each other, right there. Crown Victoria, rubbing against each other. And you can see that. You know who found that? Uh, Adam. Noah. Noah. Um, Noah found it doing a plain old vehicle inspection. You can feel that thing was just about to bust out. Noah, you may have ruined the engine on the Envoy, but you saved the engine on the Crown Vic. <laughs> Actually, he didn't ruin the engine on the Envoy. I just gave him a hard time. Oh, good. Yep. He always gets the same look on his face when you say, man, you just about ruined something here. And he goes, he gets that look. Anyway. All right. Did I ruin it? Yep. Yeah. Oh, oh, I like it.